It's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting. Welcome to It's So Interesting, where people talk about their work and life experience. I am George Spitzer. I have with me Helmut Kasper von Moltke, who is the grandson of Dorothy von Moltke. I'm very curious, how is it so many people in your family have the same first name? Is it a tradition? Is it a cultural thing? And I should mention that as we get into this conversation, we'll understand why this question is my opening question. Well, my name is Helmut because we had a fairly famous Helmut von Moltke in the family. He was, uh, in the 19th century, became a very successful general and field marshal of the Prussian army in um, three wars between 1864 and uh, 1870-71. And he won two very famous victories. The first was against Austria, called the Battle of Sadoa, and the second was against France, called the Battle of Sedan. And this was going back to the late 1800s. The Kaiser at the time gave him the title of field marshal as well as money for buying a large property, which was called Kreisau. And that is right now in Poland, but at that time was in Silesia, which is south of Prussia or part of Prussia. Right now, if you look on the map, you'll see it just above Czechoslovakia. Kreisau has a big aspect in your history and what you're doing now. The, the general, the Field Marshal von Moltke, is what relation to you? Or how did his first name end up being also your first name? Um, the Field Marshal was given a sum of money by um, the King of Prussia after his victory at Sodoa, and with it purchased the estate in Kreisau in Silesia, which was then a Prussian province. He entailed it, which meant that um, it was always inherited by the oldest son. In this way, even though he's not a direct ancestor of mine, my great-grandfather uh, was the first person to inherit uh, the property. I am now the last German owner of this property because I inherited it when my father was executed in January 1945, shortly before the end of World War II. I see. So you've had your private career in a profession that you've picked, but you've also always have had to look out for the family name and do things to preserve it. And as I understand it, from reading a book that has been published called An Island of Peace in an Ocean of Unrest, The Letters of Dorothy von Moltke, it was a very important place in German history. Could you tell me a bit about that and from your perspective? Um, Kreisau was important for Germany after the unification of the, of the country in 1871 uh, because it was linked to the war of reunification. And finally, after centuries, the German states got together and started one uh, nation. Uh, for people in the days of the Kaiser, Kaiser was a place which was linked to the formation of Germany, and they used to come and visit. And so it had a place in the German consciousness, even though it is just a little village in the foothills of the uh, mountains that separate the province of Silesia from the Czech Republic. I see, and this was back in the early 1900s or late 1800s? And this was in the in the late uh, 19th century, following the reunification in 1870, and between 1870 and um, the end of the Kaiser's rule, when Germany became a republic in 1918, was really the period during which um, Germans of that generation uh, knew Kaiser. It then has now achieved a new uh, fame because my father and his friends were opponents of the Nazis, and their group of uh, opponents 
many of whom were executed, just like my father, are known in German history as the Kreisau Circle, named for our estate. And in present-day German um, history, the Kreisau Circle is another way in which the name Kreisau has stayed in German history. I read a speech that Angela Merkel gave to your mother uh, about seven years ago, where she said essentially, if, and tell me if I'm not correct, that if it wasn't for the Kreisau Circle and your father, Helmut James, and his vision for the future of Germany after the Nazi era, Germany wouldn't be what it is today, and it is what he envisioned for Germany at the time, as a democratic country, organized the way it is, and being as potent as it is. Could you elaborate on that? My father and his friends in the Nazi period couldn't do anything to change the government. They were young men, younger men in their 30s, didn't possess any weapons or means of removing a government. So they chose to look at the issue of what Germany's organization should be after uh, the end of the war and what sort of government Germany should have. Since they were Democrats and believed in the democratic process, they foresaw a Germany which was democratic and which had open borders with uh, the countries around it. And in many ways, they were looking for a Germany such as the one which has luckily developed uh, since 1945. Very few of them were able to take part in building that country because most of them were executed before the end of the war. Just so there's no confusion, I read this in this book. It's called An Island of Peace in an Ocean of Unrest, the Letters of Dorothy von Moltke. It points out how there was a lot of unrest, and the hanging of your father was when he was 37. Historians may want to take note that the von Stauffenberg plot did not come out of the Kreisau circle, I believe. Is that correct? It, it was separate effort by another group of people. But the point is, Helmut James was already in jail for a year before he was hanged. And during that year he was in jail, the Stauffenberg plot occurred, which was trying to blow up Hitler physically in a conference room. So they couldn't attach that to him. The main aspect that Helmut James was working with was for the peaceful uh, extension of Germany after Hitler. Because don't forget, at the time, he and no one else knew, knew what the outcome of the war was, especially at the end of the 30s and early 40s. I'd like to talk a bit now about you, because with history involved, it's horrible to have your father hanged. He was in jail for a whole year, so you didn't even see him for a year. And so when was the last time you see him? How old were you? Um, I, was, uh, I was still a, a, a boy in that time. Um, maybe I should uh, remark that uh, I never knew my grandmother, Dorothy, because she died uh, very young at age uh, 51 in 1935, and I was born uh, two years later. So I never uh, got to know her and really didn't know her husband either that well because I was two years old when he died. So uh, both those grandparents are known to me really only through information which I've received from others and through Dorothy's wonderful letters to her father, which she wrote for many years. My parents moved to Kreisau, and my father took over the estate, essentially when Dorothy died. He was already running it before, but he became the person who was responsible for it on a day-to-day -day basis uh, from 1935 onwards, and therefore Kreisau was uh, the place I was born into, and where I spent um, the first seven years of my life, and where I got to know what I did of my father. But since he was working in Berlin, I didn't see him very much at all. 
the last time I saw him, I was just age six, um, and it was December uh, 1943, and I was in hospital with pneumonia, so he came to visit me in hospital at the end of the Christmas holidays as he was going back uh, to Berlin. And, of course, three weeks later, he was arrested and thrown in jail. So you got to manage the estate, or, I mean, your father had to manage the estate, and I read in that book I've referenced, referred to before, they had a big hand before then in saving the estate from uh, falling into ruin or to go to the creditors because of the depression and the inflation. Do you know much about that event, what he did to save it? We uh, had a, a difficult economy for country estates in the 1920s because of the rampant inflation and the poverty in Germany and the dreadful economic circumstances. But on top of that, we had a manager on the estate who had a brain tumor, which we weren't aware of, and it caused him to do really rather mad things with the finances of, uh, of the property, such as that uh, we were very highly indebted. My grandfather could not look after it because he was working in Berlin. And so my father stepped in, age 22, in 1929, and negotiated with the creditors to keep the estate out of the bankruptcy court. And in fact, he was successful. We had repaid all the debt. So uh, when we lost the estate in 1945, we left a debt-free property uh, to the communist Polish government. Well, that's a very polite way of saying you left the estate. You had no choice, is that correct? When I say left, you are correct in saying that we had no choice. We were, we, um, uh, it was expropriated, as was all property owned by Germans in the provinces which were given to Poland by the Allies uh, at the end of the Second World War. And more than that, the Allies agreed that the German population would have to leave, and we, like almost all Germans uh, from that area, became refugees, leaving our property behind, moving on to the West. So you had to leave basically when you were, what, eight years old? I was seven years old when we left, and I didn't get back to, to Silesia for over 30 years after that because the property in Silesia disappeared behind the Iron Curtain. We made our life in the West. How large was this estate? Was it the standard size of estates of that area? Was it larger or smaller? Actually, how large is it? Because, of course, in the U.S., estates, this concept of estate doesn't really function. So you have to explain that to us. By the standards of eastern Germany, it was not a large estate, but because it was very fertile soil, the, I don't know, 1,500 acres that, that we farmed was quite adequate under normal conditions to provide a healthy living for the family. Thus it was that when my grandfather, also called Helmut, inherited the property in 1905 from his father, uh, he realized that he now had the wherewithal to support a family and promptly sought out uh, Dorothy, Dorothy Rose Innes then, whom he had met um, previously, and married her. And she agreed to move to Silesia from her home in Cape Town, South Africa. Of the 1,500 acres, it was in a, out in the fields, or was it in a village, or was the village attached to the... I mean, how did this function? The estate had a large, what one would call a farmyard, and uh, something which well, you can call either a manor house or um, um, some sort of schloss, we called it in, in German, which was the, the home of, of the owner. And these uh, buildings were 
uh, close to one another. And um, that formed the center of this very small village uh, called Kreisau in German. It's called Czeżowa now in Polish. It is close to uh, the German town of Schweidnitz, as it was called. It's now called Swidnitza, um, at the foot of the mountains which run um, from Dresden east quite a long way. After you were forced, the family was forced to leave in 45, and you had not gone back there for 30 years, what, ha- what happened in between? It, did it fall apart? Was it occupied? Was it continued as a farm? Was it leveled? Or what happened to the whole operation? Uh, at the end of the war, the Soviet Union took a chunk of what used to be Poland in the east and displaced the Poles who'd been living there and told them to move west and move into the homes of the Germans who were being forced out of Silesia. Therefore, this, this village of ours was settled by Poles. Since it was a communist government, the land became a state-owned farm and was run as a state-owned enterprise for these years. The land was farmed quite successfully, but the large buildings which we had, for instance, our Schloss, was impossible to heat under the economic uh, conditions of Poland uh, post-Second World War, and therefore these large buildings were basically allowed to decay. Oh, so the roof got a leak or two and or collapsed and the rooms are trashed and so forth. Were, was the building leveled or is, it, or is it still standing like I see in the cover of that book I referred to? When we came back after 30 years, the, uh, the building was still standing, but it was, uh, showed very distinct sign of decay. In the next 15 years prior to Poland becoming a a democratic country again, the roof started to leak, the building started to really fall in. So it was pretty much a ruin when um, democracy came to uh, Poland. But um, the German and Polish governments celebrated uh, their massive reconciliation in our old Uh, farmyard, and the governments of the two nations agreed that they would rebuild the Schloss, and in fact they rebuilt it with great skill and with a lot of money at the government expense, and donated it to the foundation which runs it as um, a conference center and youth meeting place to this very day and has done so successfully now in the post-collapse of the Iron Curtain days for about 25 years. This is not the time to be modest. Is it my understanding correct that you had a big hand in resurrecting this whole thing and coordinating the effort? When we heard that the governments were intent on making a conference center out of it, we enthusiastically supported it because we had made lives in the West and were quite happy with our uh, circumstances and did not feel a need to move back to Poland at this stage. And so we enthusiastically supported the creation of um, this uh, youth center and conference center in Silesia and have been represented on the board of this organization for the past decades and continue continue to be involved in it, to collect money for it, to um, help make it a success. And it has become one of our goals to have our old property in Kreisau, which had a history in the reunified Germany and had a history as a resistance place uh, in the Nazi period, now become a bridge between 
the Eastern Europe and the Western Europe as they were separated through the Iron Curtain for almost 50 years. That's a, that was a big undertaking. Have you been successful? We believe we've succeeded very well. Um, uh, Kreisau has about um, 5,000 plus people who come and visit it every year. These 5,000 people uh, spend on average six nights sleeping there, so we have 30,000 nights spent. Uh, it is a place full of young people um, and sometimes also older people learning to get to know with another, to uh, live with each other, to understand that they have to stop fighting wars and start living peacefully with one another. So this, this new, the new Kreisau is really looking totally to the future. This is the wonderful thing because history fades into the past. That is the, the one part of history. But the new Kreisau that now exists is something which has an opportunity to help build the future. And that is why we have so enthusiastically embraced the support of this venture in Poland and continue to spend a great deal of time supporting it. The foundation owns the buildings, and it was a lot of the expense to restore it was paid by the Polish and German governments. What about the operations of this institution? Is it paid for by user fees? Is it paid for by government stipends? Or is it entirely a voluntary contribution arrangement? Um, the property uh, was restored fully with government funds and they donated the finished property uh, to the foundation uh, to run. Uh, but uh, to keep it running and keep it financially solvent is the obligation of the foundation. And it finances itself uh, by having the people who come there uh, pay for board and lodging. In the case of young people, it is only a modest payment that they make because they cannot afford a great deal more. The adult conferences get charged a bit more. But in this way, because the buildings were given to the foundation free of charge by the government, we've been able to make ends meet now for many years. I would presume, therefore, your family is represented on the nonprofit board of the foundation. Are you the only one on the board from your family, or are there other family members on that board? At present, I am on the board, and a son of my brother's is on the board, and we have generally had two seats on this board. But because we also have a not-for-profit supporting uh, the foundation in Poland in Germany and a not-for-profit supporting the foundation in the United States, we are active in the funding efforts for uh, venture in Poland and involve beyond our board seats in keeping it going. Of course, you've been involved with this since its resurrection in the very beginning. From your perspective of preserving your family name and the heritage of Kreisau in the future, the finances are, you're saying, is basically stable. What about the next generation? Are there any people in your family in the next generation ready to take on that mantle and feel responsible? And will they? The basis for the new Kreisau is not so much the Moltke family as it is the contribution my father and his friends made as resistors against the dictatorship. And it teaches young people that you have to be aware of the risks of losing one's freedoms. And it instills in them on the basis of the resistance against the Nazis and on the basis of the Polish resistance against their dictatorship, their communist dictatorship, 
it teaches the young people that uh, they have to be protective of their freedoms and therefore it is less a place to memorialize the Moltke family than a place to memorialize uh, the resistance against dictatorships. But of course that too is linked inextricably with the Moltke family name. As you envision it and you hope, I presume, that this will be continuing for the next several hundred years then. I don't know how <laughs> long it will continue, but I feel confident that the next generation will continue it. For instance, my older son met his future wife while he was serving on the board of uh, the foundation. I have already taken my two oldest grandsons uh, there last year together with my wife, and I'm hopeful that in the next generations my family will continue to support uh, the foundation in Poland. So there is a responsibility, and they all, everyone understands that you can't just walk away from it. it it's an important part of, of European history. As far as the functioning of the, I call it the institute or the foundation, from your view, now that you've had a few decades to see it functioning, has it been successful in bridging the European concept? I think we've been very successful. You can see it already in the acceptance that we've generated both in the German government and in the Polish government. We are now accepted as one of the major places where young people can learn from history um, the lessons which they need for their future. By the way, in part we do this with one other site which in Poland does that, and that of course is Auschwitz. But whereas Auschwitz has the very negative history behind it, from a German point of view, our uh, foundation in, in Chizhova has a much more positive message for uh, young Germans that it is worthwhile involving oneself to protect one's freedoms. Effectively, the way I understand it, you have two careers. One is the Kreisau and the family, and then you've had your private career. After you left Germany as a child, you trained to become a professional and earned a living. You've had a number, how many, how many sons do you have? Two. Two sons, and I assume one of them has got the same first name, Helmut, right? <laughs> so what did you do? What, what was your other profession? And are you active in it or are you retired? After the war, when we were refugees, uh, the home country of uh, my grandmother, Dorothy, offered to let us come there. So we emigrated uh, relatively quickly from the very destroyed Germany to South Africa. And, and, and you had, how many, it was a, when you say we, it's your mother? Um, when we emigrated to South Africa, it was my mother, my brother, and myself. I had one brother. Mm -hmm. My mother, apart from everything else, wanted to get us out of the destroyed Germany and give me in particular um, some years to complete my schooling without interruption. And that's what I did in South Africa. So I went to school in Cape Town. When I graduated, my mother wanted to come back to Europe, and I wanted to go to Oxford University, where my father had been. And so um, I was accepted at Oxford and um, studied law. I, got, I have a law degree from Oxford. I was called to the bar in London. But I spent most of my career in the business world, and did that for many years until my mid-50s when I found working in New York that I was uh, focused on North America in my business world, whereas in uh, Eastern Europe, Kaiser had come back. Uh, things were happening there which were of interest to me. So I took advantage of an early retirement program and changed my career in helping work on the effort to make the foundation in Kreisau a success. And I have spent years since working on this effort as a person who now is a senior citizen. 
which is a long way of saying you're not retired. You're fully active and will be for many a long time to come. Yes, and I can. You are perfectly correct. It's been a pretty active period since I left my business career. I have continued to be extremely active in the foundation and in other matters related to my family. And I find that it's fun being able to have what amounts to a second career after you finish the first one. How delightful. How delightful. I have been talking with Helmut Kasper von Moltke. Thank you for being here, Helmut. If you would like to contact Helmut or listen again to this show or any other show, go to itssointeresting.com. It's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting.